Hello, hello. Welcome to another Slate Review. My name is James McCool. I am the owner of PayDirtTacos.io. Uh, every Tuesday what we do is we go through the previous week's Slate. We review my lineups. We review some subscriber lineups. And we just kind of talk about the, uh, the NFL DFS Slate overall. Uh, we usually cover the main Slate and go over the models that I have over at my site, PayDirtTacos.io. Uh, talk about some things that we got right. Talk about some things that we got wrong. And... Um, you know, tilt over the, the bad decisions that we made. Um, last week was a pretty interesting week for GPPs, where like when I was first running ownership projections, uh, the things that kind of popped out were J.D. McKissick and Derrick Henry. Um, J.D. McKissick being the like pretty pretty early indication of chalk on the slate, for a couple different reasons, right? Like J.D. McKissick ended up being popular simply because he had 10 carries or 10 targets the week before when Antonio Gibson ended up getting injured. So people were slotting him in to get an increase in snaps and an increase in carries and to maintain the amount of targets that he was supposed to have. Um, and that, I mean, that logic I thought was pretty flawed, frankly. Uh, when When we looked at what was actually going to happen while Antonio Gibson was not in the game, um, that team really doesn't like to use J.D. McKissick in a role that is very heavy on rushing attempts. Um, they really like to utilize him in the passing game, and they like to utilize him when the game is not going the way they really think that it should be going. Um, for the rushing role, they had Peyton Barber, uh, and Peyton Barber was cheaper. J.D. McKissick on DraftKings was 4900 and Peyton Barber was only 4400 so for J.D. McKissick to be the one that was getting the popularity boost with Antonio Gibson out simply based on the targets he was getting um, and inefficient targets at that, right? Like even though he was getting 10, 12, 13 targets, he was still only getting like 30 receiving yards and not surpassing 15 fantasy points. Uh, if you get 13 targets and you don't surpass 15 fantasy points, then what good is it for me even utilizing that player? Um, there were there really wasn't much good in utilizing that player. So Jamie McKissick started out as like the guy who I was very, very eager to fade. Um, and I, I was very happy to utilize Peyton Barber instead. And, you know, I, I have one lineup where you see it on the screen right now where I used Peyton Barber as leverage off of J.D. McKissick um, and paired him with DeAndre Washington, where I used two really, really cheap running backs so that I could get a really expensive stack. And that was something that I don't think very many people really did. Um, and they didn't. People didn't want to utilize both of the cheap running backs. Um, DeAndre Washington actually ended up much lower owned than I thought that he was going to be. So um, that that was one way that I kind of wanted to go about things. But the, the GD, JD McKissick chalk was one that I kind of wanted to talk through. 34 Midway Mantra, what's up, dude? Hope you're doing well today. Um, the other chalk was Derrick Henry. Uh, and Derrick Henry ended up being like 35% owned or something like that. Maybe 40% owned, depending on what contest you were in. Um, and I didn't think that Derrick Henry was an ostensibly bad play. Uh, he is somebody who, when he's very high owned, it's better to be on the lower end of things and, and not be taking as much of that chalk on because he is very game script dependent. Um, if Tennessee ends up being in a spot where they're playing from behind, or if Tennessee is in a spot where they're utilizing the passing game more effectively and not necessarily focusing so much on the rushing game, then it can be really hard for Derrick Henry to end up being um, a slate breaker. For him to be a, a true slate breaker, he needs to do what he did on this slate, which was 215 yards and two touchdowns or something like that. I had 200 plus yards and, and two touchdowns for sure. Um, but there, there are, there are plenty of situations where that ends up not happening. And if you look at Derrick Henry's game logs and you look at the way that he has performed through the year, um, there have been plenty of times where he ended up not getting there, even with 30 carries, even with 25 plus carries. Uh, the Titans actually do like to use receivers in the passing game around the red zone, which is a spot that is very important for Derrick Henry to end up meeting his expectation as a very, very popular play. Um, so there were ways that he was going to be able to fail. Uh, I didn't think that he was a bad play. I thought that you could eat that chalk. Um, I did prefer Dalvin Cook for sure, who was only like 3% owned or some shit, like 5% owned. Um, 
after being very, very popular the week before and having the same exact situation uh, just against a different team where people were saying, oh, well, the Tempe defense is way better and blah, blah, blah. It's like defense doesn't matter, especially for somebody like Dalvin Cook, who if he's going to get 30 plus opportunities, then uh, you should have interest in utilizing him over another very expensive running back play like Derrick Henry, especially because Dalvin Cook is somebody who gets targets as well, right? So there, there were a lot of ways to kind of pivot away from those two main pieces of chalk. Um, outside of that, like we had Brandon Cooks, who wasn't going to be popular, and the Houston stack that wasn't going to be popular. Um, and Brandon Cooks ended up not playing that game. So then you have Houston, who was a team who I liked a lot at the beginning of the week. Um, I even wrote about them over at Line Movement. I liked Houston a lot, and then Brandon Cooks was out, and then they had just this garbage wide receiver group of like Kiki Kute, Chad Hansen, and I I mean the water boy. Like I don't even know who their third wide receiver was. They were running a lot of two tight end sets with Jordan Akins and Darren Fells. Um it just wasn't a situation that I wanted anything to do with at that point where I, I said it in the Discord and I talked about it in the team notes. Uh, I just didn't see a way uh, even with Deshaun Watson being exceptional, you know, being very, very good uh, I just didn't see a way that I really wanted to be involved in this offense with how inefficient I thought that it could be. There are very few quarterbacks in this world that can take practice squad wide receivers and turn them into a competitive team, um, especially against a team uh, like the Bears, where like the Bears aren't necessarily like a crazy wild good defense, but they understand how to lock down certain parts of an offense for sure. Like their defensive coordinator is pretty damn good. Thanks so much, Austin. Thanks for uh, subscribing for three months, man. You're great. You're uh, you're very valued, my friend. So um, I didn't have any interest in Houston after that, but I did really like them at the beginning of the week. So there were a lot of things that kind of like through this slate, through uh, a loop on Sunday morning, there were a lot of guys that were declared out. There were a lot of guys that ended up not playing. Julio Jones ended up not playing, which opened up uh, Calvin Ridley to be a fantastic play against the Chargers for sure. Um. There were, there were a couple other instances. Um, Leonard Fournette ended up being inactive, which was a really big scramble towards Locke to, uh, to figure out how to handle Ronald Jones. Um, I, I ended up giving him a little bit of a boost. I think he got like a three fantasy point boost or something like that. But um, it did like thrust him forward into cash game territory, right? Like I figured that he was going to be 35, 40% owned um, with that news. I figured people were going to jump all over that. So... Um, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. And then the, the last piece of news that really broke open the slate was, um, was the Miami news with, uh, with Miles Gaskin not playing and no Matt Breida. Um, it pretty much left just DeAndre Washington and Patrick Laird to be the effective ball handlers, uh, behind the line of scrimmage. And that made it so that DeAndre Washington was just an incredible play. We know that, um, Miami has been a team that has wanted to utilize just one running back all year. Uh, we have seen it whenever a running back goes down. We saw it when Gaskin took over. We saw it when um, we had other guys who had to step up and take care of the role. Like they want to use just one running back. They don't want to switch back and forth um, in between sets. They don't want to like be rushing guys in and out. So um, Deontay Washington at the stone minimum price on DraftKings, just like he was such a good play. Um, ended up with 35 rushing yards, 17 receiving yards, um, and got stuffed on the goal line. Like, he finished with 7.2 fantasy points, but if he ends up getting that touchdown, then he ends up with like 14 fantasy points, right? Like somewhere around there, which is great for, for 4K. I, I think that I had him in every single lineup that I built, um, especially like for a couple reasons, right? Like he was going up against the Chiefs. So I thought that people were going to assume that the, the my, that Miami is going to be playing from behind. So that's going to make it so that Washington is a little bit lower owned. Also, just the fact that people thought that um, there were other better chalk plays to take advantage of, you know, that like there was Dave Montgomery, who ended up being like 23% owned. There was J.D. McKissick, who ended up being pretty highly owned. Um, there were other guys at running back, like Austin Eckler ended up being relatively highly owned. Like that, there were these guys that ended up um, being higher owned than DeAndre Washington when DeAndre Washington, I think should have probably been the highest owned running back on the slate, just based on his price and the opportunity that we figured that he was going to get. 
So that was kind of like all the news that broke out into this slate. And it ended up being a pretty good GPP slate, all things considered. Uh, let me pull up the, the backlog really quick for this slate because I don't have it up for whatever reason. But I'll get it up here in a second. Backlogs, and we'll pull that up. All right. So these are projections, ownership projections. Yeah, Devontae Adams, Travis Kelsey. Um, DeAndre Washington projected for 20% owned and, and was not 20% owned in a lot of contests. But let's go over and look at the stacks we run. So we had Green Bay as the top overall projected stack. Um, projected for 72.68, followed closely by Kansas City, um, 72.38. Um, most of the Green Bay stack came from the Devontae Adams projection. I had Devontae Adams projected for like 33 fantasy points or something ungodly like that, but it was well justified. He was averaging 27 fantasy points per game um, and going up into this spot where Detroit just doesn't have anybody that could cover him at all. So Devontae Adams took up a, a big majority of that projection, but Aaron Rodgers and Robert Tanyan have had a pretty good rap report over the last couple of weeks as well. Uh, Robert Tanyan, I think, has the most touchdowns of any tight end in Green Bay Packers history, or at least with Aaron Rodgers, um, for sure. So that stack actually looked pretty damn good. Um, ownership on it was relatively high, but not super high. There was still good lowbacks on it. Followed by Kansas City, where it's Kansas City. Like, I, I don't need to tell you why they're projected super high. Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, and Travis Kelsey are all going to be really, really awesome all the time. Um, then we had a couple that were projected in the 60s. We had... Uh, Seattle with Russell Wilson, DK Metcalf, and Tyler Lockett. And then we also had Tampa Bay with Tom Brady, Chris Godwin, and Mike Evans. And so that was really kind of like the top focus for me, I guess, is I definitely wanted to have at least one of these stacks like in my lineups. Um, I ended up with a Tampa Bay stack, and I prioritized Devontae Adams elsewhere. I also had a Detroit stack I'm trying to take advantage of, uh, of Devontae Adams. But we'll talk about that when we actually get into my stuff. Um, the Green Bay stack did very, very well, obviously, as did the Kansas City stack. Um, Seattle actually crushed it, uh, just not with Metcalf or Tyler Lockett, really. It was uh, it was all Russell Wilson, which is an, an annoying thing of what happens when Seattle actually does put up a lot of points. Um, t Tampa Bay uh, really was quite a letdown. Um, Tampa Bay, Minnesota looked like a spot that was kind of primed to do very, very well. Um, it was one of the highest over-unders on the slate, sitting at 52. The explosive pass rates actually looked pretty good as well. Um, it was a spot where both Minnesota and Tampa Bay have explosive wide receivers that um, you know could, could really break open a slate. Mike Evans and Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, Chris Godwin, Antonio Brown, like all these guys. I talked about wanting to stack up this game pretty much every which way. I ended up stacking on the Tampa Bay side because nobody is ever really on a Tampa Bay stack this year. Um, people don't really like using Tom Brady. People don't really like using Mike Evans, um, Chris Godwin. Like People don't really like stacking them up, and it was really easy to stack them and bring it back with either Justin Jefferson or Adam Thielen, either side of that. I thought was a fine play. But uh, that was a big letdown. Um, Tempe and Minnesota closing out kind of like the top five on this slate ended up being quite a bit of a letdown. Um, after that, we had a couple teams that were kind of like fringy. Um, Tennessee is good leverage off of Derrick Henry. Atlanta um, ended up being one of the better values, um, I think. Like, and, and that game against the Chargers, we'll talk about that because I did have a Chargers stack. But that game looked like it had the potential to go really, really hard as well. And then... Um, Detroit was kind of like the last one that was kind of like a uh, an up and down. Like I, I thought I thought that a Detroit stack was a good idea because the main reason why we wanted to stack Green Bay was for Devontae Adams. So going with the Detroit stack and then bringing it back with Devontae Adams kind of um, makes it so that all the things that you need to happen can happen. If Devontae Adams ends up absolutely just going nuclear, uh, Detroit has to come from behind and pass and. Um, that's that's going to get them going as well or if Detroit ends up coming out and smashing then Devontae Adams is really the only way that Green Bay is able to come back so uh, that was another game that game stacking made a lot of sense but people weren't on Detroit they were really only on Green Bay so that's something that you can like you can usually find games like that to exploit somewhere in the slate where people are on one side and and they're on one side because of a wide receiver that is very good maybe it's Julio Jones or Devontae Adams or Michael Thomas or any of that kind of stuff but um, they're not usually on the other side. They're not usually on the side that um, people want to attack. So 
that's something that I like to look at and look forward to in each one of these slates. But overall, um, I, I think that did pretty well on uh, on stack selection and and where we needed to focus. Um, one of the teams that kind of snuck through was Denver. I know there were some people in, in the community that were on Denver. Drew Locke ended up doing really, really well. Um, projected as a good value, but I just really wasn't on him. Chicago is another team that projected as a good value, but like I wasn't going to touch Chicago on this slate. I didn't really see a reason to do so. Um, maybe to leverage the David Montgomery chalk, but like <laughs> I, I don't want to put money on Mitch Trubisky. I, I just don't. I think that he's bad. Um, he is the best QB in, in Bears history, though, with an 87 QBR, which is just, that's so silly, dude. That's so bad. So anyway, uh, let's go and talk about my lineups. That turned into a subpar game. Yeah, yeah, regarding the, the Tampa Bay-Minnesota game. And it's a bummer because, like, I did have this, this Tampa Bay-Minnesota stack that ended up doing um, okay, but not great, right? Like, 135 ended up not cashing. Um, it was pretty close. Uh, and I really like the way that I put this lineup together. And, like, it, it just, like, it petered out in just, like, a couple little different ways. Like one switch somewhere in this lineup and it ends up doing pretty well. But Tom Brady with only 15.64. Um, Mike Evans ended up being a disappointment through receptions for 56 yards. Like that, there were a lot of different ways that this ended up being kind of a bummer, but um, it really just is what it is. So let's talk about each one of my lineups. So I did have this one, which is a Tampa Bay, uh, Minnesota stack. I ended up going with Tom Brady, Mike Evans, and Antonio Brown. Um, brought back with Irv Smith Jr., who, uh, with no Kyle Rudolph there, looked like he was going to be somebody who got some extra opportunity. We've seen him get some extra red zone targets and get a little bit of extra opportunity when there's no Kyle Rudolph involved. So I really liked him at his price. And as a bring back, I've talked a lot, a lot, a lot about what I do with tight ends this year, which is really just if I'm not paying for Travis Kelsey or TJ Hawkinson or, or one of these like actual elite tight ends, like... I'm just correlating it with my lineup. I'm, I'm using a tight end from my stack, uh, like Hunter Henry, I think I use in the Chargers stack, or I'm bringing it back with a tight end from the other team and hoping that they end up getting involved. I did that with Drew Sample last week uh, for Cincinnati. Like, it, It's pretty much that I just want to focus on correlating the tight end with the rest of my lineup because it's just been such a trash can this year that that's worked just as well as anything else outside of just playing Travis Kelsey every single week. Um, anyway, that's why I use Irv Smith. Uh, secondary stack that I had was Calvin Ridley and Keenan Allen, which, um, like I, I loved that combination. I think I had that combination, uh, multiple times. I might've had it in all three lineups. No, I didn't have it all three. Uh, I, I had it in two of them though, because I did have the charter stack as well. So the secondary that I had was Calvin Ridley and Keenan Allen. And that one ended up doing really, really well. Both of them scored over 20 fantasy points. Um, Keenan Allen was a little bit of a letdown, but that game, that game could have gone nuclear and, um, having Calvin Ridley and Keenan Allen both under 8K, like that was a really nice spot. Um, at running back, I used Mike Davis and DeAndre Washington. So I had DeAndre Washington in every lineup that I built. Uh, at 4K, like I said, I thought he was the best running back play on the slate, especially considering ownership and uh, and the leverage that it offered on Kansas City stacks. Um, and Mike Davis, I, I talked a lot about Mike Davis actually this week. Um, I mentioned that his usage has like kind of been going up and he's been looking a lot more like he did in the first weeks where he was taking over from Christian McCaffrey, uh, getting more receiving targets, getting more red zone work specifically, getting more of the market share of the rushing yards. Um, and he, he didn't disappoint, right? 42 receiving yards, 51 rushing yards, five receptions, two touchdowns. So I was in on Mike Davis. I thought that was a really good spot, especially because it leveraged um, Curtis Samuel as well, who ended up being a pretty damn popular piece of things um, once DJ Moore was was declared out. So uh, this lineup, I, I like the way that it came together. I literally didn't have any more money or I would have gone up to the Cowboys defense, which would have been nice, right? Um but I ended up being in on the uh, Bengals defense. Uh, Dallas ended up putting up 30 actual real-life points and, and shredding the Bengals, mostly from uh, from the defense. So um, this lineup, I, I mean, I like the way that it turned out. There, there were a lot of things that kind of like didn't break my way. Um, DeAndre Washington was on the one-yard yard line, got stuffed. That's, you know, seven fantasy points out the door. Um Tom Brady, Mike Evans, and Antonio Brown really couldn't get it together. Tampa Bay scored 26 real-life points. It just wasn't through um, Tom Brady and his main wide receivers. 
Uh, Calvin Ridley and Keenan Allen could have had even more than they did. Calvin Ridley did very well, but Keenan Allen underperformed with uh, with the Chargers just not scoring a lot of points. Um, there were a lot of things here that that could have gone my way and could have gone a little bit better. So I liked the exposures that I had here, and I like secondary stacks as well. Uh, we'll go over the worst lineup that I had, which was a Detroit stack. So this is Matthew Stafford, Marvin Jones with TJ Hawkinson, um, brought it back with Devontae Adams. The two running backs I used were Chris Carson and Deontay Washington. Um, and then the secondary stack that I had was Corey Davis and DJ Chark. I also used the Bengals defense in this one, where again, I didn't have any money remaining in this one. This one was a capped out lineup. So I just didn't have a choice um, on playing the Bengals defense. And frankly, Dallas sucks, dude. So I, I didn't mind using a Bengals defense here, especially at low ownership. Um, I talked a lot about a Detroit stack being something that I wanted to focus on. With everybody being super into Devontae Adams and being into the Green Bay stack, uh, it just made sense for me to utilize a, a Detroit stack and hope that it was actually going to go off and have not only the, the lower own side with Matthew Stafford and TJ Hawkins and Marvin Jones all being under 10% owned, all be under 6% owned, um, but also the cheaper side of it, right? Like you, you ended up getting um, priority position with tight end instead of Robert Tanyan. You go with TJ Hawkinson, you go with Matthew Stafford, who has, you know, as high of a ceiling as anybody in the league when he's actually healthy and like in a shootout. Um, and you bring it back to Devontae Adams, who is really the premium piece of this game. So it made sense for me to have this Detroit stack. They did end up putting up 24 points. Um, it wasn't a terrible performance. It was just a little bit lackluster. Um, Marvin Jones ended up being quite a disappointment. TJ Hawkins ended up with more than 16 fantasy points, which is all that we can ever really hope for. Um, it, it was a pretty good stack, I think. Uh, and bringing back Devontae Adams, Devontae Adams, all things considered was underwhelming with just one touchdown and 115 yards, which is hilarious to say. Um, I talked a lot about Chris Carson. He was somebody who I really wanted to prioritize against, the New York Jets, um, he ended up putting up 18 fantasy points, 22 receiving yards, 76 rushing yards, and a touchdown. Uh, and that was with Seattle scoring 40 points. Like, if they just give him the ball one more time for one more touchdown, he ends up being a really, really good play at just 5% owned, which is absolutely insane. Um, for a running back against the Jets to be only 5% owned is just wild. Um, really, really liked that position to be in and talked a lot about him. Um, then the secondary stack was uh, Corey Davis and DJ Chark, and it just sucked. I, I, I mean, it, it was a spot where Jacksonville was in a perfect situation to be passing from behind, and DJ Chark just couldn't get it done. He couldn't get connected with Mike Lennon at all. Um, Corey Davis wasn't utilized as much as I would have hoped that he would have been. Uh, Derrick Henry ended up being the big dog that he is in December. So uh, Corey Davis was leverage off of Derrick Henry. Um, and a spot that I really wanted to utilize. DJ Chark also leveraged off of that, hoping that it would be a more pass-centric game. Um, and it just ended, ended up not coming to fruition, and it is what it is. But this lineup um, came, together, came together really, really nicely. Um, I could have come down from Carson to Dave Montgomery and came up from DJ Washington to somebody. I could have come down from Carson to, uh, I, I don't even know, somebody 5K, um, maybe duke johnson or something like that but i i probably wasn't going to be coming off of anybody in this lineup um the the one thing that i think i could have done uh in retrospect is go with aj brown instead of Corey davis and drop down to colin johnson for jacksonville who has been doing pretty well but um i didn't really see a need to do that i really wanted the uh the top wide receiver for jacksonville and uh somebody who i respect a lot with Corey davis so that was this lineup uh, we will jump into my quote-unquote best lineup, which was a Charger stack. Uh, it was the Chargers of Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, and Hunter Henry brought it back with Calvin Ridley, um, which was a very, very natural and easy pairing to have. Uh, I also used the secondary stack of DK Metcalf and Brashad Perryman. Um, DK Metcalf, somebody who I always want to focus on if I think that the Seahawks are going to be in a spot where they're not in an actual shootout and where volume is not plentiful. I would much rather have DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. And having Brashad Perryman just made a lot of sense because he's a big play guy for the Jets. Jets ended up, of course, only scoring three points because Adam Gase um, is the stone fucking worst when it comes to everything in the NFL. And uh, I just hope that he has a really bad day. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, that secondary stack, that made a lot of sense. This was one of the first lineups that I built, actually. Usually it's the first lineup that I build that does best, which is funny. Um, 
but the running backs that I used here, this was where I was like especially different, was usually was using Peyton Barber and DeAndre Washington and just basically punting running back. Um, I knew that people were going to be kind of all over Derrick Henry. People were going to be really into J.D. McKissick. People were going to be into David Montgomery. People were going to be into Austin Eckler. Um, so just straight up punting running back with two guys who I thought were going to get a big uptick in um, opportunities at the very least for their price. Uh, that's something that I like to do in GPPs, especially if I'm going to get somebody at less than 1% owned, this direct leverage on some bad chalk with J.D. McKissick. So there were some questions. I, I, I mean, the, the Barber play was questioned by a couple different people and like, I get it. It's, it doesn't feel good. Um, but it's not like Washington has been bad over the last couple of weeks. And they've been a team that has been very, very good in terms of defense and holding teams uh, and keeping them honest and, and keeping Washington in games. So if Washington is going to be in games and I think they're going to rush the ball, we've seen what Antonio Gibson has been able to do, um, behind that line and, and with opportunity. So there was there was no reason to think that Peyton Barber couldn't get lucky. Um, and yeah, he would have needed to get lucky. I, I kind of pegged him in for 15, 12 to 15 carries and like maybe one to two targets or something like that. Um, he ended up having 37 rushing yards and, and one reception for two yards, but he ended up getting the usage that I wanted, just didn't end up getting there. And that's kind of the gamble that you take in GPPs where – um, especially like this lineup was, was pretty chalky. This lineup had a whole bunch of guys over 10% owned. So having Peyton Barber at 1% owned, um, made a lot of sense to me to differentiate things. I was shocked that Calvin Ridley was only 7% owned. I thought that he was going to be way higher than that. So, um, I, I took a lot of this. I, I correlated the Washington football team with Peyton Barber. Um, I had correlations everywhere. The only one that was not correlated was DeAndre Washington, which is fine because he was a running back. Um, Overall, I, I liked the the positions that I had on this slate quite a bit. The only thing that I kind of wanted to have was an Atlanta stack, um, which wouldn't have done as well as like I had wanted to anyway. Um, but I, I had positions to all the things that I wanted to have anyway. All right, let's talk about my cash game lineup. So uh, cash was very, very good this week. Um, I don't know exactly how many I won. I think I probably had like a 70-something percent win rate in head-to-heads this week, I think. Um, ended up recouping basically everything in terms of the GPPs. I, I did end up losing out on a couple hundred bucks this week simply because I had, I entered qualifiers, which I never fucking do. And um, it was just like the last chance to get into the NFL Live Final. So I was like, eh, all right, I'll take some shots. Um but overall, head-to-heads were, as usual, very, very good. I have a, a 68% win rate in head-to-heads this year in NFL overall, um, which is obviously fantastic. Uh, hopefully, I am able to kind of like maintain that through um, NBA when I start focusing more on NBA and a lot less on NFL. But um, cash games uh, this week were Aaron Rodgers, Derek Henry, Ronald Jones, Devontae Adams, Prashad Perryman, um, Chris Hansen, Chad Hansen, Chad Hansen. Uh, not Chris Hansen. He's, he's the sit down guy. Uh, Chad Hansen, Logan Thomas, DeAndre Washington, and the Seahawks defense. So this is against a PSU fan, um, who's a very, very good cash game player and a very good DFS player overall. Um, him and I both had Aaron Rodgers, Ronald Jones, DeAndre Washington, Devonte Adams, Rashad Perryman, Chad Hansen, um, and the Seahawks defense. The only difference that we had was that I had Derrick Henry and um, Logan Thomas, and he had Travis Kelsey and J.D. McKissick. Uh, and, like, that's all that it was. It was just a, a straight-up 2v2 where I had basically – it was basically Derrick Henry versus Travis Kelsey, right? Like, that was the 1v1 that we had, and um, Derrick Henry ended up getting the best of Travis Kelsey. I think his cash lineup um, made just as much sense as mine did, right? Like, we were on basically all the exact same spots. Um the only frank difference was that he focused on having Travis Kelsey, who was actually the uh, higher owned between Logan Thomas um, and Travis Kelsey. He, he had the higher owned one. Um, he also had J.D. McKissick. The The only problem was that J.D. McKissick was less owned than Derrick Henry. So I, I could have seen using my strategy, getting the exact same lineup that he had if I didn't want to prioritize Derrick Henry, who I thought was going to be kind of like a very, very necessary cash game lineup. But I understand going Travis Kelsey as well. And um, that's kind of 2v2 that I think I faced a lot this week. Um, there were a couple guys that beat me because of like DeAndre Washington or, or people that beat me because of um, – 
David Montgomery over Ronald Jones. Like that was another 1v1 that you could have had in cash games this week that I think made a lot of sense. So um, if you go with David Montgomery over Ronald Jones, uh, you end up sweeping cash like without a doubt in my mind this week um, with my lineup. Like you maybe lose like two to three percent of your head to heads if you have David Montgomery instead of uh, Ronald Jones. So the process behind this was really, really easy. Um, it, it pretty much like started with the cash game building blocks of Devontae Adams, Derrick Henry, Ronald Jones, DeAndre Washington, um, and the Seahawks defense, along with uh, kind of leaving open a slot for those last three. I, I think that I also recommended Brashad Perryman, um, which would have left you with the quarterback and the wide receiver to kind of fill in. Um, and that was just kind of a situation where like, Going Theron Rodgers made sense to pair him with Devontae Adams, but you could have also had a couple other options that made sense. Um, some people went with Russell Wilson. Some people went with um, Justin Herbert. Some, pe- like, some people went with Patrick Mahomes. Like, th- there were a lot of different quarterbacks you could use. It just made sense for me to use Aaron Rodgers um, in that spot for sure. So um, the catch games were pretty easy this week. I think, um, Ronald Jones ended up not being as highly owned as I hoped that he would have been. Uh, it was actually David Montgomery that I should have gone with, but it is what it is. Um, those are the lineups that I ended up putting together. So, uh, overall lost a little bit this week. I mean, it wasn't a bad week by any means. Um, cash games carried me through and that's pretty much what happens. Um, this was the last week that I'm going to have like regular volume in NFL. Um, I tell everybody and I always tell subscribers um, and anybody that will listen, frankly, that um, in the last month of any sport, you should be dropping your volume a considerable amount. Um, the edge that you have in every single sport is in the first like half of the season where there's still a whole bunch of new players, a whole bunch of casual pe- players, people that haven't burned all the way through their bankroll that are still making the same decisions week after week after week. Um, that's where your edge really lies in every single sport is in the first half of the half of the year. Um, and then you have like that third quadrant, right? Like you have the that period of like a month or two months where um, – Things are starting to get a little bit tougher, but so much is solidified that you can make really good informed decisions and there's still enough like, um, I don't want to call it fish money, but the, there's still enough bad decisions being made by the field that you can take advantage of things because now after the first half of the season, you have a really good baseline for the stuff that you have put together and for the projections and you can make really good informed decisions now um, for the next couple of weeks, for the next month or two. And then you get into the last month of the season. And the last month of the season... Uh, the only people playing at this point are professional DFS players um, and people who like have had a hit that are just going to be throwing money at the wall and like kind of trying to hope that they finish the season strong. Um, but the edge is like so far gone at this point. And you can like, you can take those professional DFS players now where you are facing a lot of professional DFS players, a lot of very good players towards the last month of the season. And now you're ramping up the variance from the teams where you have teams that are not playing their starters or guys that are reducing snap counts or guys that are reducing minutes or like widening rotations, uh, getting rookies some play, stuff like that. So the variance gets ramped up and the competition is much harder. So you don't have as many easy decisions to make. Um, and it just makes it so that like the last month of the season is just kind of like a drain for your bankroll unless you're a top tier player. So I always tell people to lower their volume a considerable amount the last month of the season and start focusing on the next major sport or like focus on other sports. Um, so in this instance, like we have NBA starting up in a week. So in a week, you should be focusing like very, very, very much on NBA and very, very, very little on, on NFL. Um, because NFL at this point, like things are going to start to get pretty fucked up. Things are going to get squirrely. Things are going to get weird. Um, and only the best of the best are going to be continuing to play. So it gets harder to actually be profitable towards the last month of the season. Um, and like, we have the benefit of like counter-strike, which is an everyday sport at this point where you can be focusing more on that. If you have good models, if you have a good process for counter-strike, you can focus on that like basically year round. Um, but with the major sports, the last month, like this last month, I'm probably going to be playing maybe a quarter of the regular volume that I have been playing throughout the year um, while I focus on NBA and actually go headfirst in NBA. So 
Um, that's kind of like my my main thing here where I, I just want to talk through that stuff. So raise girl, bad decisions. Yeah, bad decisions are made. Um, and there, there are a lot of bad decisions that people don't think are bad decisions. But like when you look at them in hindsight, um, it, it can be pretty bad. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's review some lineups. Um, let's go to this one. This is from Worm369 in the, in the Paydirt community discord. Um, oh, actually, I need to get this one. All right, so he ended up putting up a score of 152.42. Um, he went with Deshaun Watson um, as his quarterback and Chad Hansen as the wide receiver paired with Deshaun Watson, brought it back with Allen Robinson. Um, he also had Tyreek Hill, Hunter Henry, Russell Gage, DeAndre Washington, Chris Carson, and the Seahawks defense. So the correlations that I'm seeing here are Hunter Henry and Russell Gage, along with a skinny stack of Deshaun Watson, Chad Hansen, and Allen Robinson. Um, Tyreek Hill as a one-off, and then also utilizing Chris Carson with Seahawks defense and DeAndre Washington. Um, this is a pretty damn good lineup, all things considered. I would say that um, Deshaun Watson, like especially with how cheap that Houston stack was, if it was going to get there, like he has to throw for multiple touchdowns. I, I don't think that Deshaun Watson um, ends up getting there with his legs. He hasn't really done that much this year overall, so I don't like counting on those things at this point. Um, there was kind of like a layup play of utilizing Deshaun Watson with Chad Hansen um, as well as Jordan Akins at tight end, which would have put you onto Russell Gage. And um, I, I would guess um, Keenan Allen instead of Tyreek Hill. Um, and that would have kind of like shirt up the correlations that you had. It wouldn't have made it like a better scoring lineup, but it would have made it a better correlated lineup. And the process would have been better on it. Um, but I love Chris Carson in the Seahawks defense. I love DeAndre Washington. Um, the balls on taking a Houston stack period, I, I can commend you for that as well. And um, focusing on that Chargers in Atlanta game, I think that's a fine decision. I don't think there's anything wrong with this lineup um, objectively at that point. If you thought, if you played this thinking that Sean Watson was going to have to do more with his legs because there were no wide receivers to actually use, then this is a good lineup. I, I think that using a skinny stack in that kind of a situation makes a lot of sense. Um, overall, you weren't overly chalky either. Um, DeAndre Washington was the highest owned player that you had, but um, overall, pretty good lineup for sure. So this one is from Butters in the community discord. Uh, it is a Detroit stack with Matthew Stafford and Mohamed Sanu um, brought back with Devontae Adams for a game stack. Uh, the running backs that he utilized were Dave Montgomery and DeAndre Washington. Um, and then he used a couple of different one-offs here. Um, DK Metcalf, Michael Thomas, and uh, Logan Thomas, as well as the Cowboys defense. So first off, uh, Matthew Stafford doesn't rush ever. So you can't really use a skinny stack here, um, especially not with Mohamed Sanu, who is like the wide receiver four for the team. Um, it just would make a lot more sense for you to utilize TJ Hawkinson um, and like Marvin Jones instead of uh, Michael Thomas and then bring it back with Devontae Adams, something similar to what I did. If you were dead set on using Mohamed Sanu, then that's fine. But still, you'd want to use it with two different pass catchers and then bring it back with Devontae Adams. Um, Matthew Stafford is never going to win you a GPP with just one wide receiver doing very, very well outside of very, very unexpected situations um, and, and things that don't happen near enough for you to go this route. Um, and then utilizing just one-offs, like I understand the one-off of Michael Thomas since he's like the only guy that's really utilized in that offense, but we haven't seen him find his ceiling unless it's a competitive game. So with that being said, you would have you should have used somebody coming back from Philadelphia, whether it be Dallas Godert or Jalen Rieger or or somebody, you know. Um, it just made a lot more sense to to correlate him as well. And DK Metcalf is probably the only one off here for a wide receiver that I that I can really condone, just simply because the Jets are so fucking bad. Um, that it made a lot of sense to to utilize anybody against them, and and you know you don't need to have somebody coming back against DK Metcalf because the Jets are just that bad. Uh, David Montgomery, um, as I noted in the notes, this is a pretty damn good spot for running back up against a team that was probably going to be super inefficient. I wasn't on him. I wanted to fade him again. Um, 
just because he has been super inefficient in his career. And when he's popular, like I'd much rather just fade that inefficiency and hope that he doesn't bust an 80 yard fucking run on the first play of the game for a touchdown. Um, but he did and life is hard. So it is what it is, you know? Um, but it, it was a good play overall at only 23% owned. I don't think that's worse idea, especially when you have a Detroit stack. Um, you could have used a full Detroit stack with green Bay here. Um, with the game stack and made it so that this lineup was more competitive. But overall, just using Muhammad Sanu with Matthew Stafford was a mistake and not something that you really should have done. Uh, let us look at this one. And then I'll maybe do one more and then we're, we're going to hop out of here. So this one is from NEO720 in the community discord. Uh, regular member, good guy. He ended up with uh, Tom Brady, Mike Evans, um, coming back with Adam Thielen. Uh, he used Chris Carson, who I liked a lot. He used DeAndre Washington, who I liked a lot. Um, he also had Michael Gallup and Jordan Akins and Devontae Adams. So the main thing here is utilizing only one wide receiver with Tom Brady. Um, Tom Brady is another guy that, like, if he's going to find his ceiling, he's going to be passing to multiple wide receivers. He's going to be able to support at least two wide receivers, um, or two receivers, I should say, because Gronkowski does count in that mix as well. So going, uh, like, simply going with Tom Brady and Mike Evans doesn't quite do enough to find you enough upside to win you a GPP. You really need to have another player. Um you could have easily gone with Gronkowski here, right? Um, and then brought it back with Adam Thielen. Um, and then you probably would have had to drop somewhere, right? Like you probably would have had to drop Michael Gallup or or drop um, maybe Chris Carson or something like that. But it was pretty necessary for you to get two wide receivers here with Tom Brady. Um, I liked Michael Gallup a lot uh, coming into the game for sure. He had taken over the wide receiver two role from C.D. Lamb. Um, Dallas just simply didn't need to use their wide receivers all that much in this game. It was kind of like a route, um, and it is what it is. Um, but using multiple one-offs here just doesn't really do it for me. Um, there, it's kind of like the same reasoning as last lineup. Like, yeah, Devontae Adams as a one-off is fine, but um, Devontae Adams bringing it back with even Mohamed Sanu from, from the last lineup like makes a lot more sense. Um, doing a secondary correlation with that definitely ups the percent chance that those cheaper plays can actually get there. Um, or if you would have gone, instead of going Devontae Adams, going with um, Allen Robinson, like that automatically gives you a natural correlation between Jordan Akins and Allen Robinson. And then you can upgrade Michael Gallup up to Antonio Brown, and then you have your stack and you have your correlations that make a lot, a lot of sense. And you end up doing fine. Um, you actually end up doing better in this lineup if you uh, make those correlations and make those changes that I just suggested. Just make sure that you're focusing on those correlations um, unless there are like very, very obvious and severe one-off situations. Like DK Metcalf, I think, was a very, very obvious situation where you could have used him as a one-off here um, just because the Jets are just so fucking trash that like bringing somebody back there doesn't really need to happen. Um but Devontae Adams, like, very easy to bring it back with TJ Hawkinson. Um, Mike Evans and Tom Brady need at least one more wide receiver to be a good GPP stack. So, um, yeah, th those are those are really the notes. And it kind of comes from, like, a, a common thing. I, I think that we've seen a lot of people talking about how correlation isn't necessary in GPPs. And, like, we've seen a couple lineups with two tight ends win um, big contests lately. And it's like... You need to understand that there are 17 slates in NFL and not succumb to recency bias and not succumb to short sample sizes. Um, we, we have seen some like kind of wonky shit win GPPs, but that doesn't mean that wonky shit should be what you're doing. It doesn't mean that you should be focusing your process around the wonky stuff that um, kind of catches lightning in a bottle. Because if you, were to, if you were to do stuff like that for an entire N N like NBA season specifically – or MLB season, right? Like if you, if you do some weird shit, like if you saw somebody win a GPP with two hitters against their pitcher um, and a full stack going the other way, like that that's not something that's going to win you money over time. Like that's going to be something that happens once and then people chase it and lose a whole bunch of money chasing stuff like that. So um, correlations are proven. They make sense. They, they are a way that logically they and un they unlock the upside of every player in your lineup um and it makes it so that you have to be right about less decisions over time while also making money on those decisions so 
it's just important to focus on the correlations. Um, and that's kind of going to be like one of the other lessons. Like we, we talked about two lessons here, lower your volume at the end of the month of a regular season and correlate your fucking lineups. Uh, Brian Walker, 1175. Do you typically only do secondary stacks with wide receiver, wide receiver? I try to do running back, wide receiver, secondary stacks, but those don't typically work out. I tried Bernard Gallup. Thanks for the content and discussion. First off, happy to have the content and discussion. Um, secondly, if you're going to do a, a running back, wide receiver correlation stack, like, well, first I'll say, um, no, I don't only do wide receiver, wide receiver. I also do wide receiver tight end quite a bit. Um, I try to correlate passing games because those really unlock the, the upside, but, um, Wide receiver running back or even tight end running back works. You just have to understand the game circumstances that happen to make it work. So in a situation like Bernard and Gallup, um, what you're hoping for is that Bernard ends up doing really, really well and making it so that Dallas has to come from behind, hence unlocking the upside of Michael Gallup and having it be where um, Gio Bernard, a running back for a team, if the running game of that team does very, very well, and the other team has to pass from behind, that's where the wide receiver then has a better chance of finding their ceiling because of Gio Bernard. Um, you can use a more succinct example with uh, Derrick Henry and DJ Chark, where Derrick Henry and G DJ Chark can be a secondary correlation um, if you are doing it under the understanding that Derrick Henry rushes for 200 yards in the first half, and then Jacksonville has to pass from behind in the second half Hence, upping the ceiling and upping the probability of DJ Chark finding his ceiling. Um, it's just about understanding. And like, I, I think that one thing that a lot of people should just be doing every single time they build a lineup is asking themselves like out loud, if you have to audibly saying, how does this work? Like, how does it make it so that this lineup ends up getting there? Like, I'll do it with this lineup, for example. Okay, so how does Tom Brady end up winning me a GPP? He ends up throwing four or five passing passing touchdowns. Okay, so if he's going to do that, then what does that mean that the rest of my lineup needs to look like? It doesn't mean that you only need Mike Evans. Like, if Tom Brady throws four touchdowns, it's very, 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 very unlikely that he throws all four to Mike Evans. It's very, very, very unlikely that he throws all 350 yards to Mike Evans. So it's much more likely that that is split between two or more wide receivers. Okay, so if the only way that Tom Brady wins me a GPP is by throwing four, yard, four touchdowns and like 350 yards, then it's much more likely that there are two wide receivers that benefit from that and not just one. Okay, so if that is going to happen, if I think Tom Brady's going to do that, then what does it mean for the other team? Okay, well, we're going up against Minnesota. It is likely that Dalvin Cook ended up having like 100 yards in the first half and two touchdowns, and now Tom Brady has to throw from behind. So you could use Dalvin Cook there. It's also likely something that could happen that Tom Brady and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin all hook up in the first half. Uh, Tom Brady throws for three touchdowns in the first half, 250 yards. Uh, Mike Evans crushes, Chris Godwin crushes. And then Minnesota also has to pass a lot from behind in the second half. And that means that one of the wide receivers or both of the wide receivers from the other team are going to have a better chance of finding their ceiling because there's going to be more passing in the second half. Um, and, and those are just like, that's just an example of like how you need to be thinking about your lineup. Like every single thing, if you were to continue looking at this lineup and say, okay, how does, uh, how does Michael Gallup get there? And, and like, if you're just using him as a one-off, you're just like, oh, he has a hundred yards and a touchdown. It's like, okay, so if you're going to do that, then just go bet that prop. Like, you don't want to be making it so that you have to have, like, seven different things go your way. You want to have as few things have to go your way as possible um, in order to actually find success in your lineup. So, um, like, with this one, you, you can say that Tom Brady and Mike Evans end up crushing. Um, Tom Brady throws three touchdowns to Mike Evans. Um, and then Adam Thielen ends up with two touchdowns as well. Um, Chris Carson and DeAndre Washington are fine. But then, like, you also have to say Michael Gallup ends up with – a uh, hundred yards and a touchdown. Jordan Akins has to end up with like 60 yards and a touchdown. Devonte Adams has to end up with like 160 yards and a touchdown. Um, all of those things have to happen together. And it's just hard for all of those things to each individually happen. You want to be focusing on as few things as possible. Like I, I can go talk through mine really quick. Uh, for this lineup to work, like Justin Herbert has to throw for four touchdowns and 300 plus yards. I think that's going to come to two wide receivers for sure. 
um, Keenan Allen and Hunter Henry. If that happens, then Calvin Ridley is likely going to be getting more volume in the second half because of the upped passing. Um, Peyton Barber, he can get there because he has an increase in usage because there's no Antonio Gibson and it's leverage off of J.D. McKissick. DeAndre Washington can get there because there's going to be more usage because he's the only real running back left um, and he's going to get the goal line usage. Um, if DK Metcalf ends up ac- absolutely crushing it, then I think that the Jets are going to be passing from behind. Rashad Perryman is the best chance for them to have big chunk yardage, so I'm going to utilize those two together. If Peyton Barber ends up doing very, very well um, and ends up getting like 18 rushing attempts, then it, Washington probably kept the game at least close or had a good lead, so the Washington football team makes sense here. So just think through your lineups. Don't just build a lineup because it projects well. Don't just build a lineup because it fits well. Don't just take players because they fit. Build lineups that make sense. Build lineups that can actually have a good chance of winning you something. Um, And walk through and think about your lineups and think about your roster construction when you are building things like that. All right, last question. So Austin37 so when taking talking this point, can you do a Gallup versus Berrios? I thought Gallup was the better leverage over Berrios. Um, what what do you mean? So like when when we are talking about um, Gallup versus Berrios in terms of like Berrios being leverage over Brashad Perryman. <coughs> Oh, Perryman. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I like, I think that in a vacuum, yeah, Gallup was a good play against um, Perryman for sure in terms of like, di- like indirect leverage because they both cost the same and they both uh, were in spots where they were both like kind of the same wide receiver. But if I'm playing DK Metcalf, then I definitely want Rashad Perryman and not Michael Gallup. Um because Brashad Perryman, if DK Metcalf ends up doing well, well enough to win me a GPP, um, then it is very likely that Brashad Perryman is going to be getting more volume in the second half, hence giving him a better probability of finding his ceiling. Um, with Michael Gallup, you don't have that probability boost because we don't think that Cincinnati is going to be leading or like putting up a competitive game. So um, while yes, in a vacuum, Michael Gallup versus Brashad Perryman made a lot of sense in terms of like a direct leverage pivot. Um, it was just hard for me to want to do that because then you would have to get the Cincinnati player right as well. And that's kind of hard to do correlation, but I was MME meeting so for my cheap wide receiver one off. It was between those two. I think that's fine. Um, if you are like gonna punt wide receiver with one player, definitely using Michael Gallup instead of Brashad Perryman made sense. Um, I still would say that you would want to use the Cincinnati wide receiver with him or the Cincinnati tight end, maybe Drew Sample. But in a vacuum with that scenario, yeah, you made the right choice of taking Michael Gallup instead of Rashad Perryman, I think. Anyway, that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for uh, for tuning in and, and listening to me talk uh, about all the things NFL and uh, and game theory related. Uh, my name is James McCool. You can find all my work over at paydirt.ghost.io, ramping up for the NBA season. Pretty excited about that. But regardless, thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out with me, and I will talk to you guys later on.